Hi everybody, um, my name's Anthony Bale and I'm speaking to you from my kitchen here in London um, and I'm going to be talking about the manuscripts and editing of John Mandeville as part of the Dark Archives Group's um, project on making an unedition and thinking about unseen and unheard kinds of text. Um, I'm really grateful to the invitation for the invitation to record this and talk through some of the, 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 the issues involved. Um, and really this is to pick up a quite speculative conversation that came out of the earlier Dark Archives meeting, which was thinking about how what an unedition might look like and what the rationale for that would be for one of the most popular texts in medieval Europe, Mandeville's Book of Marvels and Travels. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the textual issues involved in editing Mandeville, and the, this is a particularly pressing issue because there are so many different manuscripts and printed editions of Mandeville, over 300, and also different language traditions from Latin to Gaelic to Danish to Italian to, you know, all over the, the continent. So this um, is particularly, um, it's something I've, I've done quite a lot of work on because about 10 years ago I was working on a new translation of Mandeville for Oxford's World's Classics and this was published in 2012. Um, as Sir John Mandeville, The Book of Marvels and Travels. Um, and one of the main challenges I faced there was finding an authoritative text or version of Mandeville to work from. What Mandeville was I going to translate? And it's really hard in terms of Mandeville to think about an authoritative edition. So I'm going to talk about some of the difficult issues and cruises that I faced in editing Mandeville. And these are both practical kind of editorial problems, but they're also intellectual issues in trying to constrain a text as unruly, as vagrant in its focus as Mandeville. And what I found is that we in, invariably end up making choices about what text we want this to be, um, not just about meaning, but about how we um, package and represent the text. I should say before I get started properly, a few words about the title of the book that was eventually published. Um, usually Mandeville's text is called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville in modern editions and in scholarly writing, with Mandeville's name being given as part of the title and as the name of the author. My press, Oxford, was absolutely adamant that I had to keep the name Mandeville as the author because people will look under M in bookshops or search under author as Mandeville. Um, and so I had to keep that name rather than anonymous. And I was happy with that. I, after all, we don't insist on calling Georgia Elliot Mary Ann Evans um, under her real name. So I don't mind the fact that we don't really know who Mandeville was. That's the name that's given to the text. More problematic really was the title because when we call Mandeville's work the travels of John Mandeville were making a decision and a judgment about its subject matter and its literary genre. To call it the travel suggests it's a work of geography or pilgrimage literature in keeping with the medieval generic categories of the itinerarium or the peregrinatio. It suggests the emphasis of the text, the efficacy for the text of the travel guide and constructing the book as the travel sets up the author retrospectively as a kind of ethnographical detached um, spectator on the world that he writes about, putting the text into a colonial and um, orientalist history of tourism and curiosity. And this is quite different from the intertwined, ambiguous, ironic, and sometimes baffled tone of the text. As Geraldine Henger said, Mandeville's is a text manifestly anxious about the stabilizing structure of late medieval Christian identity. It's not an assertion um, of Christian power, but an interrogation, I think, of difference and affiliation. Not only is the text not really just about travel, it's also about politics, religion, natural law, natural history, religious affiliation, difference, trade, and it also purchases on different kinds of writing, different genres of writing, things like the confession, the encyclopedia, the mirror for princes, the sermon, the romance, and the um, crusade tract. These are all different versions, uh, different genres that Mandeville um, uses. So travels is a very partial description of the work's content, but also at odds with how medieval audiences knew it. Often they didn't give it a title at all, but if they did, they would call it something like the Book of Mandeville or the Book of Marvels. 
In French, the narrator author calls it in the text, a livret, um, a little book. And in French, it's usually called the Livre des Marvets. Um, in English, it's called things like the Book of John Mandeville, the Little Treaties of John Mandeville. And in manuscripts, it's sometimes referred to as the Tractatus de Mandeville, the Romance de Mandeville, the Geste de, de Sir Jean Mandeville, and also the Itinerarium of John Mandeville. Um, the Livrette de Terre Sainte, Mandeville on the Diversité de Paix. Um, all different descriptions, some of them specifically generic, some of them broader. As far as I know, only one early manuscript um, in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris gives it a 16th century title, which is Voyage de Jean de Mandeville de Saint Albans. Um, and most others just mention Mandeville by name. So I chose Book of Marvels and Travels attributed to Sir John Mandeville as my title, because that seemed most in keeping with how a medieval audience um, received the text and what they thought of the text. And really that's one of the things that an, an, an unedition can do is to put um, audience and response back into the modern text that we read and receive. So the question of a source text is at the root of lots of formal editorial practice. As the editor is encouraged to strip back accretions to a text and return to some kind of original preferably in pursuit of the author. This is certainly how I was taught when I was a graduate student thinking about editorial principles. With Mandeville, this is an especially interesting issue, but it's quite complicated and I hope you'll bear with me. And at this point, I'm gonna share my screen and go to PowerPoint, I hope. Okay, great. Um, okay, so, um, for the most of the late 19th and most of the 20th century, scholars working on Mandeville were mainly interested in identifying Mandeville the man, uh, Mandeville the author, and finding a specific precise place from which the text emerged. This has proven to be a profoundly successful, unsuccessful undertaking, um, and no actual Mandeville has been um, convincingly or fully convincingly found. This is partly because there's no definitive or authoritative urtext or authorial holograph, and partly because 20th century scholarly methods of working backwards towards such an urtext are very unsuited to a text like Mandeville's, which is vagrant and accretive in its shape. The earliest text of Mandeville seems to have been in the French language in the 1350s, possibly in Northern France, possibly in the city of Liège. And, but the French, English and Anglo-French versions all emerged very um, soon around, us, around the same time. Now I'm gonna go to this slightly complicated slide, which gives you a simplified version of the descent of the text. Um, and it's, um, it, it's very tricky to, to, to take this apart in any straightforward way. So I'm really just putting the slide there, but basically you have a lost archetype from the 1350s, probably French or Anglo-French. Um, and then you have a continental version, very close to that um, in French, which then goes down that left-hand column to become the French, German, Spanish, and eventually the Italian and Dutch versions. You then have an insular version coming from England, which is also in French and Anglo-French, and that then begets Latin and in in English insular versions. Um, and this is all before, this variation in text has all happened before around 1400. And um, when Mandeville's text um, really is very popular. So in those first 40 years of its existence. Then on the far right hand side, you get various subgroups of the English text, often called the defective version, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you can see there's 39 manuscripts of that defective version. And that's the most popular version of any of these. Um, and then that becomes the basis of the Gaelic and Welsh versions, but also the English printed editions. 
And then if we go back to the left-hand side, we've got another version, the Liège or um, Augier version, which then begets further um, continental versions. Um, and, and then there's a whole other printed tradition, particularly in Italy in the late 15th century. Now, and um, the text I chose for my edition is subgroup one of the defective version that far right in red using Queen's College Oxford manuscript 383. Um, but we won't, I won't go into any more detail, detail about that. So what you can see is that the, the, the Mandeville manuscript has been put into this kind of very traditional um, family tree genealogical structure, um, which traces descent. And the aim of this descent is to show the departure from the earliest versions. What this descent doesn't really do much with is popularity or dominant versions. Um, so some of the earlier versions are very minor um, in terms of their readership, um, but they, they are older. And so they, they tend to be privileged as being closer to some kind of original version, a better text, if you like. Now, all Middle English texts are basically versions of a French or Anglo-French text, but the Middle English version was the most popular, most widespread, and, and, and in fact, all these English versions on the right-hand side of this slide are themselves obviously in ongoing and vigorous processes of revision and um, selection um, throughout their long history. And the defect defective version is so named because of a missing choir in one of the original copies of it. Um, and it's a rather rude name for it, but it's stuck. Um, I don't like it, but it's what people call it. Um, but it's the most widely known of the English versions um, and was the base text for Richard Pinson's English printed edition. And it's called defective because of this gap. So what, what it reads, it's called the Egypt gap. And it reads, the Sultan also holds the caliphate, which is a great thing for the Sultan. It's like saying in our language, he is le roi, the king. And then it carries on without a break. This valley is so cold, one can go up St. Catherine's Mountain and moves on to talking about Sinai. And so basically there's a gap between the account of Cairo, Fustat, where the Sultan holds his caliphate and the and St. Catherine's um, monastery in Mount Sinai. Um, and what's, what's assumed is that a choir went missing at some point and that um, became, made it defective. Now, really interestingly for me, medieval readers don't seem to notice or be bothered by the fact that the text suddenly jumps in this way. Um, and um, responsibility for meaning, which is invested in copyists and scribes and readers, um, that they didn't seem to be bothered by this. Meaning's not invested here in the author in what someone called Mandeville originally wanted the text to say about uh, Egypt. What actually, where meaning actually is invested is in the um, manuscript tradition which proved popular. So this kind of um, foreshadows or um, kind of calls to mind the ideas of the French theorist Roland Barthes, um, because Barthes argues that no author controls what his text can be taken to mean, the kind of death of the author idea. According to Barthes, it's language that speaks, not the author. So what I'm gesturing towards here is the need to move more generally, but also specifically in Mandeville studies to a reception-based kind of scholarship, which can accommodate and respect the medieval audiences um, multiple and often eccentric understandings of the text, rather than privileging an invented authority of the best text or the authorial intention. And this is where the idea of the unedition becomes very attractive. So I'm going to give you a few more examples here where an unedition could be really great in terms of Mandeville's text, um, where there's kind of cruces in meaning. Okay, so Mandeville talks about um, a moving picture um, of um, St. Chariton, um, Cariton, um, two miles to the south of Jerusalem, the church of St. Chariton, who was the abbot there, and there's still a painting there showing how they grieved when he died. It's an affecting thing to see, a piteous thing to behold. Um, and what actually seems to have happened here is that there wasn't a painting in 
the earlier text, there was actually a skeleton. And a scribe at some point misread compaginati, skeletons, for compincti, painting. So you get, you move from the saint skeleton to a painting of the saint, but it's the painting of the saint that remains the dominant version of the text. And so people think there's a church of St. Cheriton with the, um, with the, with, with the um, painting of the saint, not of his skeleton. Um, similarly, there's a, a kind of more um, interpretively interesting thing about the relics of the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, um, called by Mandeville the King's Chapel, um, in the French manuscripts, it seems to say that the um, Genevois, the Genoese, got the relics from Constantinople and gave them to the French king. But in English, um, Genevs or, or um, something like that becomes Jews, Jews. Um, and then that begets a separate Italian version, Judei. Um, now, um, historically, neither of these are true. The relics were actually got via Venetians and Templars, but that's not so important. The, what is probably in editorial terms, the different minims, the similar minims of Geno Genoese and Jews, Genese and Jews, then, so you can account for that in paleographical terms easily, but it becomes a whole other um, literary tradition about the Jews role in um, Furta Sacra and the translation of relics and the brokering of relics and their financial extortion for relics. So it then becomes part of a whole history of anti-Semitism, um, which, which Mandeville's text is adduced as a proof text for. Um, so the scribal error then becomes itself a meaningful um, reading, if you like. Um, and then, um, Let's see what we've got here. Yeah, and then there's an account of poison in Sumatra, where in some of the French manuscripts, the antidote is to um, eat fien, excrement, um, droppings, but then a, a scribal, a scri one scribe writes um, foy, um, leaves, and then that gets translated into English as leaves. Um, and so the, the meaning changes, but again, the leaves become the most dominant reading here. So, um, uh, what about here? Yeah, and then here's um, just one final um, example of this, um, which gives you the kind of how you um, work with the different manuscript variants. This is Mandeville's account of the Holy Foreskin. Um, again, um, one of the relics taken to France. Charlemagne was in the temple when an angel brought him the holy foreskin, the prepuce of our Lord from his circumcision, and afterwards King Charles had it taken to Paris. And then, so I've given you here at the top the French version of that, um, which is the kind of basic Mandeville text, but then also some of the variants here. Very few of them actually say prepuce, foreskin. They say, or they, they, they understand what Charlemagne is being given here in all kinds of interesting ways. The présence, the premise, le nombril, the navel, la prophétie, la circoncision. This might actually suggest more than anything that, that the medieval audience didn't really know what a foreskin was or what the circumcision was meant to be, or it might regard some, it might show some, um, some, some doubt about this. You know, the holy foreskin was frequently mocked and doubted in the Middle Ages. But you'll see that the most common variant is le premise. So, which doesn't really make much sense. The premise of our Lord from his circumcision, unless you understand that to be a prefiguration, a prophecy, um, that the circumcision was the forerunning, um, for, for, foreshadowing of the, the um, crucifixion. And then, even though the holy foreskin was in fact a, a widely um, venerated relic, the text gives it in lots of different locations. Some of those are keys to um, where the um, manuscript came from. They privileged, say, the Liège relic of the foreskin over the um, Charu um, version of the foreskin, which was the most famous pilgrimage one. Um, but they also give places in um, Aachen, Aix-la-Chapelle, Poitiers, um, Liège, Chartres, um, Rome, where they're 
um, were competing foreskin relics or no foreskin relic. Usually, they very rarely give Charu the most famous foreskin relic, which is often misunderstood as Chartres. Um, and then in English, in the English manuscripts, the word prepuce, prepus, is only used in Middle English when translated in any text from French or Latin. And most manuscripts, um, many manuscripts omit it. So again, there's a kind of sense in which people did not know quite what they were copying here and what, what the angel was giving Charlemagne. Okay, so um, uh, this is, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the end in a second. So what we're seeing here um, is that medieval authors, um, medieval scribes, sorry, um, were themselves authorial agents in the transmission of, Manu of Mandeville in lots of highly meaningful ways. And the text was in this process of constant change and re-reception. Um, and given that The Travels is a compilation of other people's writings and itself about kind of extraordinary fantasies and manifest untruths, there's little reason for us to privilege one thing that we know to be more historically true than other things in the textual tradition which were read and accepted and repeated. Um, it's not clear whether one or many people actually wrote Mandeville's Travels, whether it was first written in French, Latin, English, Anglo-French, whatever. But as Ian MacLeod Higgins has said of Mandeville, the author is not so much dead then as deeply and probably in irretrievably encrypted. So this process of encryption is what I'm really interested in, in terms of how we can think about an, an edition. Um, if we take some of these variants out, then we end up, I think, um, actually making the editor sovereign. The editor is something of a vandal, damaging and censoring all kinds of alternative versions of a text um, and, um, and, and taking a very positivistic and um, uh, instrumental uh, way of reading to this really wonderfully rich text. So um, I think my last example um, will be um, here, um, what happened to St. Luke's body. Um, so um, Mandeville says there too at Constantinople lies the body of St. John Chrysostom, who was the um, Bishop of Constantinople. There also lies St. Luke the Evangelist as his bones were brought from somewhere where he was buried. Um, this is given in lots of different, as lots of different places. Um, usually to Beth, it, it's usually given in manuscripts as Bethany, but also to Betain, Brutain, which sounds more like Brittany, um, Bithnia, Britannia, um, could be Britain, um, could, it, there's, there's all kinds of uh, Bithynia, Boeotia in Greece, all kinds of places are, 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 are given in the manuscript. But it's often corrected or hypercorrected, if you like, in by modern editors um, as uh, to, to, to Bithynia to put it in Asia Minor, which is more historically correct. But that's a very unusual reading in medieval manuscripts. By far the most common reading is Bethany, which would be a site in Jerusalem, well known to medieval Christians from pilgrimage literature and from the Bible. Um, and so shouldn't we, isn't there an argument either for presenting the text as Bethany or presenting the text uh, with all these different options to them? Um, almost like one of those kind of fantasy novels from the 1980s where you could choose your own ending. You can choose where St. Luke goes to depending on this whole range um, of, of options. Um, similarly, I just put the words Kos and Lango at the bottom here. Um, the medieval text describes the islands of Kos and Lango as two different Greek islands. Um, many of you will have heard of Kos, um, but not of Lango. But in fact, Kos and Lango are the same place. Kos is the Greek name and Lango is the Venetian and Genoese name. The Venetians ruled the island um, from 1204 to 1304 and the Genoese from 1304 to 1523. So many modern readers correct this to Kos but medieval readers thought they were two separate islands called Kos and Lango. So I, in my edition, retained Lango, but the fact there's not a real place called Lango separate from Kos is to me less important than the fact that medieval people thought there was. 
So what I'm saying here is that we need to take license um, when we are editing. One of the we need to think about how the book was received. Um, and we need to remember that medieval readers did not seem to get hung up on the idea of fact, but they read the text with its contradictions and reliabilities and vagaries intact. And in fact, they often extended them. What I'm not trying to do is espouse an endless set of differences constantly in praise of the variant to use one manuscript theorist's phrase. I really want to take the idea of the variant out of the picture in a way, and instead think about a dynamic set of versions in which we can privilege the movement of a text through time and through its audiences, rather than the idea of the text varying from some irretrievable state of perfection where it's fallen from its author's design. We need to find ways of unediting our texts in order to retrieve what they meant to their medieval audiences. So I'm gonna finish with the words of a modern poet, Matthew Francis, who has taken Mandeville as his source and who seems to me to capture the very essence and admixture of doubt, imagination, spuriousness in, in, and, in, and, sin and sincerity, which characterizes Mandeville's book. And this is what we should be aiming for in an, an edition of Mandeville. I, Sir John Mandeville, have traveled to here and here and, believe, and seen this wonder and that and returned home. Believe me, what I've said is true or as good as or was once. We've traveled across the world and received only sores, blisters, fever, wounds, chills, sunburn, hunger, and thirst. We are tired and this may be some spell or delusion. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and look forward to seeing you soon to talk about um, making an, an addition.